Oh, hey, I'm Coco, and welcome to our talk show, Single and Too Tired to Mingle. We'll be talking about relationships with ourselves, our exes, our kids, and other important beings. So stay tuned. Hi, Christy. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here. You're so welcome. And thank you for getting up at 7 a.m. to have this uh, chat with us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure. I get to watch the sunrise with you. So thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, so we're speaking to you. You're in West Virginia right now. Um, and you have such a colorful background. I'm so excited to hear your whole life story today. Um, so you have uh, graduated from West Point, obviously the most prestigious kind of military academy in the US, uh, where you rose to ranks of captain. You actually spent two years in Baghdad as well. So that's pretty amazing where you are also um, you earned a Bronze Star Medal, a Combat Action Badge, uh, an Army Commendation Medal. So you've done pretty well in the, in the Army. We'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so on another hand, you're a breast cancer survivor. So you had breast cancer at 36. We'll have a chat about that as well. Um, and after that, you started running marathons, ultra marathons. <laughs> so crazy. Um, you've also climbed up the ranks in um, the largest biotech companies in the world as well. So, uh, and your career has now transitioned into you doing your own thing, which is uh, a motivator and helping other people build businesses. Is that right? Helping women specifically in biotech come into their most authentic selves. So helping the next generation of leaders, if you will. So you could say their own personal brand and business within the biotech space. Oh, amazing. <laughs> it's always nice. Women supporting women is amazing always. <laughs> um, so last but not least, and this is why we're here today, we are going to talk about your book, which is, uh, we kind of find a lot of similarities between our books. Uh, <laughs> so yours has the uh, title of The Unapologetic Spinster. And we're going to be, of course, talking about that uh, as well. I'm excited to talk about that. And we definitely have some, we both read each other's books. So we've got yeah, some similarities, <laughs> but they're also very different perspectives of the dating world. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there we go. So cool. Yeah, similar but different. It's really good. Um, so why don't we start kind of going through your career a little bit? So tell me about West Point. Um, what's it like being a woman at West Point? Um, and how did you manage to kind of rise through the ranks to do what you did? Yeah, so West Point, as you mentioned, is a military academy. It's in the United States, in New York. Um, it is still like university. So you go through four years, you're getting an academic education. There's a physical component to it. And then of course there's the military component and it's all about preparing then um, a whole wave of leaders for the army. So after four years, you graduate and you start as active duty as an officer in the army, which was the beginning of a five-year service term that I had. So West Point is vast majority men. My year, I graduated in 2004. We graduated with only 14% women. So there's about a thousand people in each class and about 140 of them were women. Uh, so it is, um, you know, it, I was 17 when I started at West Point and I would say it's a, it's definitely a shock to the system, uh, and being such a small percentage as a woman was definitely very hard, but it also kind of shocked me into what the reality would be in the army. And quite honestly, the percentage is not that low in the biotech space, but it, that's also very much, um, you know, male dominated, if you will. So it's, I guess it's been a theme in my professional career so far. Yeah. So interesting. Was it, did you find it daunting or did you find that you kind of found your way to fit in? How did they take you as a leader? Because obviously you were leading your ranks in Baghdad. So I was lucky. I have an identical twin sister. We went together, but I also have an older brother. He was three years older. He went to West right. Point. So three out of three oh, wow. kids in the family went um, to West Point. So with my older brother going there, we, I grew up outside of New York City. I was, um, I was able to visit West Point. I knew what I was getting into. And my dad gave right. me great advice before I started there. He said, 
you know, it's a game, play the game, play by the rules and you'll be fine. And so I went through uh, with that mentality. I made it about three years on the fourth final year. This playing the game was starting to get old um, and it was, it became tougher, but just knowing what you're getting into is half, half the, you know, half the battle to some extent. Um, but then coming out as a leader, it is, I mean, you say it's a prestigious military academy. I, I think it's all about leadership. So when I think of West Point, it's, we're taught to be leaders. We're taught to be followers before we're taught to be leaders, but then we study it. We put it into practice during our four years there. And then we come out of there being ready to lead, which is why at the age of 21 or 22, people are deploying and they're leading platoons of people that are, you know, twice more than twice their age. Um, so being accepted as a leader, as a woman, uh, it's different for everyone, depending on where they are. I, uh, my first unit, when I became an officer in the army, I was actually in a cavalry squadron, which is, um, you know, combat arms. It was when they were integrating logistics, which I was into the combat arms units. So I was the only female officer. Uh, There's about 500 people in this unit. And I was one of eight women, the only officer um, that was, was a woman. So that was, that was very hard. Uh, And then I changed units and I, you know, being a woman in the army, I had unique experiences and it was very difficult. Do you have any any anecdotes for us? What, like any stories that are kind of interesting or fun or sad um yeah I mean I would say who um such a broad question because it was you know it's nine years of my life in total from the West Point and then the five years in the army there my first deployment to Iraq which is where I got my bronze star and my combat action badge I was leading a platoon of soldiers 40 of them they were you know, selected from our unit to be on the roads every day. So we were in charge of, we would wake up every morning and I wouldn't know where our platoon was going or what we were going to do. It was, um, you talk about flexibility and agility and people say, oh, I'm, you know, when they're interviewing for job, I'm agile and I can react to this. I mean, to me, there's nothing more than waking up in the morning and not knowing where you're going in a combat zone, what you're going to be doing, who you're going to be taking with you, who you're going to be responsible for. And ultimately you are responsible for all of it. So um, I would say that that was a very important year of my life. It flew by in some ways. Um, but, you know, the, the a little anecdote within that, we would do a lot of our missions at night. Uh, And we would be on the roads. And so we'd be in our up armored vehicles and we'd have to all be awake. Right. So we'd be drinking our little, you know, um, caffeinated drinks and we'd be looking for stuff. We'd be looking for roadside bombs. We'd be looking for things out of the ordinary. And there is some animal in Iraq, in Baghdad. I don't know what it is. It looked like a small hedgehog. And I would always see it in the middle of the road. And I didn't want it, you know, us to run it over, but So I would kind of shriek when I would see it and I'd be on the radio on our headset and my driver would, you know, freak out because he thought I was seeing a roadside bomb, but I was seeing just a hedgehog in the middle of the road and I'd see its little eyes looking at us. So I, um, I learned how not to worry about the hedgehog. (laughs) That was what, I mean, it was just kind of the like, don't hit the hedgehog, right? You know, we're trying to save ourselves and I'm trying to save save a hedgehog. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. That's the very human aspect of you still comes out in war. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That was, must've been quite tough. I would imagine. Um, did kind of, did the army affect your mental well being at all? Or were you able to get over that? Or how did you deal with that? Cause it's, it's a difficult and unique position to be in. Yeah, it definitely affected my mental well being, but I didn't realize it for quite some time. Um, you know, without going into it, um, the things happened in the army that I, as a woman that I was, um, not okay with. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't, I wasn't sexually assaulted, but I dealt with a lot. And I dealt in my second deployment, um, with somebody who was my direct supervisor. And I learned to step up and have a voice and speak up for myself and, um, make it formal, make a formal complaint about what was happening. And the army, um, brushed it under the rug and I had to learn to stand up for myself. And I, there are no lawyers to support, um, victims of situations. 
And when you're in Iraq, there's certainly no, I can't go hire a lawyer on my own. So I had to find the, this is, you know, finding a voice is my theme, I guess, it's, which is why I also wrote a book. Uh, it was very, very hard for me because the army continued to, to sweep it under the rug. They acknowledged what I said. They said what I um, was claiming was true, but then they swept it under the rug. And because anyway, so it's, it's, it's a whole nother discussion um, that yeah. affected me. And I didn't know how bad that affected me until, you know, I know, I know you're probably going to ask me about breast cancer. It was after my diagnosis with breast cancer, 10 years after I got out of the army, what I was diagnosed with a form of PTSD, it's called military sexual trauma, which is specific for those who've had certain types of, um, you know, trauma related mental issues, uh, which for me presented as clinical depression and severe anxiety. And I had had that for 10 years before I was ever even diagnosed. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about your breast cancer then. Do you think that because of all that stress that you endured and kept it in, I would imagine that that's how it manifested? I think that's part of it. I also think it, I was exposed to environmental conditions in Iraq. We had burn pits, which there's a lot of toxins. There's a lot of uh, military people that, you know, they, they get out or they're in, you know, ten, several years later, they have some sort of um, cancer. It seems very prevalent. So I think um, the, elect the vehicle I was in that had electronic warfare on it, you know, we worry about having a cell phone in our pocket. Well, I had a giant electronic, um, you know, type of warfare on the hood of my vehicle that right. could block cell phones 250 meters away. And that was sitting five feet away from me. So, um, but there's also the emotional component of my life, um, you know, after. So I think it all kind of compounds where I started to lose sight of who I was and that happened as I transitioned out of the army and maybe was a result of having these, you know, these things I was still trying to cope with. Um, and also perhaps the, you know, you know the re long-term relationship I was in that was no longer serving either one of us. So breast cancer to me is also an energetic, you know, it's, it's of the heart, right? It's around the heart, the heart energy center. And I, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I was single at the time. But I had, so I've been dating after my long-term relationship. I'd fallen in love. I was, you know, I write about it in my book. I was experiencing heartache. So take all of that. I think all of that plays into where was I holding my emotional pain and that, you know, and what environmentally could have been a, a trigger to allow that to manifest. I think that's all part of it. So you don't have any familial uh, kind of nothing. It's just, just no genetic stuff. markers, no genetic markers. No, nobody in my family history has ever had breast cancer under the age of like 65. Um, and I had it at 36 and I was a vegan marathoner. I'd never drank alcohol. I was eating super healthy. So it's, it, it was bizarre, very, very shocking to happen. I'm sure. Yeah. So how long was the treatment and are you in remission now? Is it all okay? Or hopefully that's not too personal, but um, it's something that a lot of women obviously go through. So, well, I found the lump and I found it very early. So thanks for nothing. All you Tinder dates. Uh, exactly. I laughed so much when you wrote that in the book. It's like, come on guys. <laughs> it's, but it's the first thing that came to mind. It's like, well, I mean, I gotta, I gotta do everything myself here. So um, I, I <laughs> found it and I was very fortunate to have great care. I lived in the Boston area at the time. It was stage one. Um, I elected for a double mastectomy and reconstruction, which allowed me, um, because my lymph nodes were clear on that side, I didn't. So even with stage one, you decided to go for double mastectomy? Um, there's a bunch of different factors, but I, I wanted to live without fear, right? I was, I'd already started this journey of reinventing myself. And so as I had been reinventing myself and I'd been, you know, single out there, you know, it was a 10 year relationship and now I'm dating other people and there's, you know, things you've got to overcome just from a physical standpoint, an emotional yeah. standpoint, reinventing myself. And then boom, this happens. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just, um, we're going to, we're, you know, I called it my upgrade, right? I was a runner. Like I, I called it my upgrade. Um, it was all, it's all about pers perspective is what sure. I want. Um, and I wanted to use it as my superpower. 
uh, you know, because right. I went into therapy after breast cancer, um, was, you know, di- clinically depressed, was diagnosed with that and anxiety and PT in the form of PTSD. So, um, so I really, for me, it was about mental, but it was also, this surgery was very drastic and it was a difficult surgery, you know, to recover right. from, especially as a runner. Um, but I was lucky based off of the genetic testing they did on the tumor itself. I was borderline for needing chemo. We decided not to do chemo, but I was put on, um, two types of medications for five years, which put me into, uh, medically induced menopause. So at 36, I went into menopause, um, as of this fe- past February, I hit five years of treatment and I came off my meds. So I'm now, I'm, I was, I've been in remission for five years years i'm cancer free is what i would say i'm cancer free so moving on to a slightly um more fun i guess subject is your book the unapologetic spinster um i have to say i haven't done a lot thank god of online dating but i can definitely um see a lot of uh, similarities as to what you've written and i can't believe how much you've done i have to say (laughs) it's like wow um so talk us a little bit about that and i love kind of some theories that you've put on men and relationships um so let's have a little bit of a talk about your ripe avocado theory i love that i think it's actually so true as well (laughs) uh so a friend had said that said that to me once upon a time she said you know men are like avocados you go to the grocery store and you at least here in the us right we have a bin of avocados and you go in and you're like you know i'm gonna make I'm going to make some guacamole in two days. So I need an avocado that's going to be ripe in two days. So you're predicting when an avocado is going to be ripe, which is honestly very hard to do because you, it depends on the temperature of your house, what season it is. Is it going to, you know, all you're going to put it in the fridge. Who knows what some people do to make an avocado ripe or slow down the ripening of it. And so you're trying to predict all this stuff and you go into the bin and you hit, you, you touch all these avocados, which is kind of like dating. You're going on a million dates to try to find one that that's going to be ripe and ready to make guacamole, which is, you know, have a family, get married, whatever you, your end desired end state is. And you go, you find your avocado, you take it home, you put it on the counter and you're like, every day, I'm just going to, you know, check to make sure the avocado is about ready. And you're just doing your business. You go in and you touch the avocado one and you're like, oh my God, the avocado is ready. Gu- we got to make, stop everybody. got to make guacamole. Other, this avocado is going to be bad by dinner tonight. Right. So you have, you know, you have your guacamole for, for lunch. Um, men are like avocados in that as the avocados, they're just kind of sitting in the bin, waiting to be picked up, whatever. You're not right. They put back in the bin, but then one day they wake up and they are ready. And my theory often, at least for people I've dated in my thirties and now into my forties is when they are ready, it's literally the woman that next walks in the door or picks them up that they're going to marry and, and, and it, and it could be not their type. Like I know so many guys who have become ripe avocados and then it's just like, it's like, but, and that's who you chose after all your dating and all, and that's so, um, you know, it, it is, it, it's a timing game. I don't think it's a numbers game. It's a timing game. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, those bins, hey? <laughs> Do you have any deal breakers when you're dating? I have my personal deal breakers. I mean, as a a pretty healthy person, I don't smoke. I'm very active. And, you know, I want somebody who's fit because I want them to be able to keep up with me. I plan on living a very long, healthy life and I want them on the journey with me. So for me, deal breakers are around lifestyle or lifestyle choices that would keep them from um, enjoying the things I want to enjoy. And I'm open to enjoying the things they want to, they want to enjoy. Right. Um, so those are my types of deal breakers. I do have, um, a chapter that I talk about is my very first online date experience where I realized one of my, my deal breakers and, I won't say the whole story, but ultimately I, I need somebody who can protect me. Like I want somebody who can protect me. I've, I've been in combat. I've had to protect 40 soldiers. I've gone through breast cancer on my own. I've, you know, all these challenges I've overcome on my own. I, I still want somebody to, to be there for me that if, you know, that they're going to protect me in a way that I can't as a petite, you know, person, you know, like, 
just physically the physical kind yeah. of, well, I think that's sweet, yeah. yeah. So if, if I, if somebody is, is not, you know, of, I don't feel that kind of energy from them. It doesn't matter like how tall they are, though. That helps for me, it, cause, but it's not just that it's like an energetic for me, whether somebody's a match or not is very energetic. I, it's, it's an intangible and um, yeah, so I, I need them to be able to protect me in that manner. Yeah, I think so. I agree. Um, and I think it's interesting talking about the energetic part. So what I found, um, and maybe you found the same, I don't know, is when you meet someone in real life, you can feel the energy immediately or not. Right. And then if you do kind of feel the energy, you make a, uh, an effort to, you know, get in contact and it's just kind of more spontaneous. And I found whenever I did any online dating, even if the guy was nice, and I have to say, I've met really nice guys online as well. Um, and when I've had dates with them, even if they're nice, I just feel like there's no connection or it's different, or maybe you need to invest more time. It's just, it just felt that it's not the same way to date. So I gave up on that pretty quickly because I just found it quite awkward. I don't know, do you have that experience or something else maybe? Well, um, so I think there are two things there, the energetic feeling with somebody and, and recognizing whether or not you have a connection, but then the, also the forced manner that uh, of dating, which is online dating. So I am not on dating apps anymore. I, I went on a couple hundred first dates in the boss. I can't even believe you did that. <laughs> and I, I mean, oh I, was, like, I write about it in my I, I write yeah. about how I was, you know, I needed like, you know, I'm a very competitive person. I'm going to go on seven dates in seven days and how I. F Do you not lose the will to live after that? <laughs> I didn't because it's all about perspective. And for me, I was, I had three goals. So I know I'll bounce down back to that other thing. I had three goals because I'm a goal oriented person. Number one was I wanted to learn something about myself on every single date. Number two was I wanted to learn something about something else, whether I learned about this person's profession, which I, I dated pretty much every profession or people who didn't have jobs at the time. So I learned something new that I didn't know, which felt like growth to me. And then the third was to go somewhere new. So every chance I had, I went somewhere new, whether I was in Boston dating and I'd come visit my sister in Virginia, we would, you know, I'd go to new places and it was about exploring and it was different because the vast majority of the time, I was not going to want to see this person again. So what was in it for me? It was getting to know somebody and having a, um, a human to human interaction that was pleasant that also helped me on my journey. So that's the only reason I didn't go, you know, totally nuts after <laughs> dating all of these people. But um, so but I'm off the dating ass because I think it is very forced. And so to your to your point. I, um, it is to me, I've always said it's, it is trying to recreate the love at first sight in aisle seven of the grocery store. So yeah. if you are, you're trying to force, um, that initial connection, most people think, oh, this person's very attractive. I'm going to swipe right on them, but you don't really know until you see them in person. Cause most people don't look like their pictures or you're seeing what you want to see in a picture. And then yeah. in person, you're like, oh, I see that maybe that's a, they're a little bit different and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you, when you're out and about and you see somebody that you find attractive, you're like, that person is attractive. So, um, we just don't, we have to, in order to have that you know, experience, you've got to swipe right on how many people and then line up the dates, invest the time and the energy. And to me, it was like, it's not, it's not a winning proposition. So, um, I, yeah, I've, I have not had, um, anyone of super significance. I've not fallen in love with anybody that I've gone on a dating with on a date. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I found, yeah, I found that would be almost impossible. Actually, it would take a long time for me to do that with someone from a dating app, I think. Yeah. So for me, if I'm going to fall in love with somebody, I know pretty immediately. I know it's just like who I am. I Yeah, I think so too. And so I've dated and I write about that in the book too, the slow burn effect. Cause I had so many people say, Christy, you're not giving them enough time. You've got to, you know, do this, you know, slow burn. I go, I'm not a slow burn. I'm like a bonfire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bonfire. Like people say, but a slow burn is going to last longer. No, it's not. I don't even understand that. You have a candle. That's a slow burn. That candle, like that candles out, right? You have a bonfire. 
that bonfire is going to be smoldering for a very long time. So I'm bonfire all the way. Like you light a match, it it lights up. Um, I'm not. I think, well, I'm I, not, I, think yeah. I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's a character thing as well. Some people prefer that. Some people are more, you know, fiery and outgoing anyway. So they want that. So I don't know. I prefer the bonfire too. <laughs> And but people will say, but Christy, the bonfire hasn't been working for you. You need to try the slow burn. I trying the slow burn, and I write about it in the book because most of my book is humorous. Seventy five percent of it, I would say, is is meant meant to be funny and witty. And this is a different way of looking at dating. But I would say seventy five percent are like is like that, and twenty five percent is some of that heartache. And one of the heartaches is a slow slow burn where I really hurt somebody, and I don't yeah, want to hurt yeah, anybody. That's true, because, you know, he was, he fell in love with me and I felt nothing for him. And I try, I tried, I, it just, it's not, it's not who I am. And that's the biggest message of my book is be yourself in dating and yeah. know what you want. And everybody has an opinion. What matters is your opinion and what you want and follow your heart. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. Um, so you write about. I thought it was quite interesting. Okay, so we all know what ghosting is by now, right? Uh, tell me about breadcrumbing. So breadcrumbing is um, like Hansel and Gretel. You know, they you leave some breadcrumbs and they follow the breadcrumbs. So um, I would say let's let it's happened to me, uh, and I and I called it breadcrumbing because they were giving me just enough for me to keep following them, right? And just enough text messages, just enough interactions, just enough. We'll have a date here, there. And before you know it, I'm following these little breadcrumbs. I'm still hungry and I don't know where I am. And then all of a sudden they ultimately disappear. So breadcrumbing takes you to Casper, who's going to ghost you. That's how that's, I, it's just, I, I don't know anybody breadcrumbing never turns into anything. They're, they've in, yeah, in the online dating, they've got a lot of people they're breadcrumbing and they're going to, you know, choose out of convenience or something else. Right. So, yeah, I think it's all or nothing and the bonfire. <laughs> I, you know, I'm right there with you. I don't have time. I don't have time, nor do I want to invest in games. And if somebody plays, yeah. games, I'm immediately turned off. I'm like, you go do your thing. You're not even close to being a ripe avocado or what it's not. No, thank you. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's got to be all or nothing. Like, it is what it is. <laughs> um, so tell me something else. So, okay, fine. You're 40. I'm even older than you. <laughs> so, and we're both single. Um, and we've both had quite interesting careers and have gone quite far. So my question is, is it a good idea to lower standards for people that you want to be involved in? I mean, like, don't, why are you, why are you lowering standards? Okay. I have, I, if my aunt watches this, she's going to be like, oh my God, Christy, you called me out. I got a bunch of aunts. So nobody knows which one. I had an aunt say to me one day, she said, Christy, you know, you're almost 40. This was several years ago. You're almost 40. Maybe rather than, um, you know, try to find a 10, you should try to find a seven. And I go a seven, a seven. So that one day I bump into my 10 on the road and I'm like, oh, I should have just waited. I should have waited five more days. 30 days, three years, 10 years. It doesn't matter. That person would be worth it in my mind. I'm not going to settle for somebody. I'm not going to get in, entangled into a complicated life situation that is not fulfilling because I know that they're not the right person for me. So I, for who I am, again, it's the all or nothing. It is. I am, I know what it's like to be in a 10 year relationship that ran its course way before it ended. And we, it was not serving either one of us and we moved on. And so now it's been seven years for me and I have never been in a relationship. I've been in situationships or what have you, but I've never, I've not committed myself to anybody because the timing's been wrong. They haven't been ready. The ones I've wanted, or they haven't chosen me or, you know, whatever it is, it hasn't worked out. I'm not going to just say, well, I am going to be with somebody because that means that I don't want to, I'm, I'd rather be with somebody than just be by myself. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy al alone, like not in a relationship. I'm very happy. I'm not lonely. There's a difference between being lonely and alone because a lot of people are in relationships. And I think you write about this a little bit in your book, like you're in a relationship, but you are 
you you're you you feel lonely, but you're not alone. So I'm I'm confident and capable of um, finding the love within myself rather than seeking it from somebody else. And as and while I'm like that, I'm still also incredibly hopeful and expectant, if you will, that my person is going to come into my life and the wait will have been worth it. And the last thing I'll say on that is I'm so confident about it. I wrote it into the beginning of my book, which is dedicated to my future husband. Yeah, that's look at all the I had to go through, but on my way to you, I found myself. And for that, I am eternally grateful um, because the love we all seek is within us. And that's why I would never settle because I don't, I don't need to, because I'm okay. I'm okay on yeah. this journey. I think a lot of people settle because they're not okay on their own and they're scared of being alone, um, which is actually quite sad. But at the same time, it took you quite a while to come to that as well, which you write in your book. And there's a specific incident where you actually got a company award for, I don't know, being the best at what you do. And you got sent off to the uh, Cayman Islands, to the Ritz-Carlton. However, you felt like a loser, despite the fact that you've won this award. You cried yourself a little bit, to yourself a little bit in your hotel room. Uh, so tell me, how did you kind of, how did you get from perhaps not kind of wanting to be on your own to now being confident that you're fine as you are and you'll just wait for your man? But that was, um, that was actually the catalyst that ended my 10 year relationship. I went, you know, in the pharma industry, you go to your national sales meetings and I won president's club, which you get back on the main stage. I was one of three marketers in this big company to win this major award. And they they were going to, it was an all expense paid trip to the Cayman islands. And I go back for my work trip where I'd won this award which, and it was scheduled for several months later. And I told my boyfriend of 10 years at the time where things like, were just waiting, you know, to, to be to finalize, um, we were still together. And I said, do you want to, you know, you want to go on this trip with trip with me? And, and he was no. And I'm like, okay, well, that's it. Like, then we're done. Right. Cause I've won a once in a lifetime trip. Yeah. So for, it was the nail in the coffin of my 10 year relationship. And then fast forward a few months, he's moved out of my house. He's moved on. Um, and I'm starting to date and I couldn't find anybody to go on this trip with me. So it was like showing up and there's um, 150 other people who've won this award. They, every single person had somebody with them. I couldn't even bring my twin sister because she was pregnant um, with one, with her son. And this was during the, like um, the Zika virus and we were in the Cayman right. Islands, So she couldn't go. Um, it was so sad and so pathetic for me. I think I just cried in my hotel room, but then I just pulled myself together and I go, I'm just going to, I'm going to do this. And I found people that were so welcoming and they wanted to include me. They're like, oh, Christy, come with us, come with us. No, Christy, come with us, you know? And so it became kind of like, oh, it's kind of fun. I don't have to worry about anybody else. It's just me. And so when you mm -hmm. fast forward a couple of years, um, I learned to go on vacations by myself, which I found so empowering because I like, I will go to dinner on my own. I don't worry. I don't care what anybody thinks it's about, it's about me. And am I enjoying the experience? Am I growing? And, um, I, it, it forced me also to look into new hobbies like scuba diving, because I wanted to explore even more, which then introduced me to more people, which I just like mm -hmm. started to evolve where, where now I'm very, very careful. If I go on a trip with somebody, do I want to be with this yeah. person for however many days, because I really enjoy being on my own. Um, but with the right person, I absolutely like, I, you know, like I really want somebody who like also loves scuba diving, for example, or wants to get into it and just go and do that with somebody because I will appreciate them with me that much more yeah. the right person, right? The right person mm -hmm. is what's, what's most important. I think it's funny because my book is called single and too tired to mingle. And I actually often get questions, but, but are you really too tired? <laughs> And I always say for the right person, I'm never too tired for anything. <laughs> yeah, too tired to mingle doesn't mean if he walks in the door right now and you say, or you bump into him, right? Like mingle, I think implies that you're going out and you're putting all of this effort in. And that's kind of what I think about like dating apps. Oh my gosh, it's so much effort. And does it versus just live your life? 
and yeah. and that it'll attract that person in. Yeah, and there's so much to do in this world. Like, wow, there's so much stuff to do. Yes, and your life is so, full. Your life is full, so it's not. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, that was amazing. So tell me, what do you do in your new role now that you've decided to break away from Big Pharma? Uh, you've gone on on your own, which is amazing, and congratulations. Um, so what do you do? Tell us, how do you help people, and women specifically? Um, so I was in the biotech pharma industry for 12 years. I went up every single level, moved very quickly, um, all the way up to vice president of marketing, head of marketing uh, at a biotech startup, which was what I wanted to accomplish. So I got there. But on the way there, in the beginning of it, I mentioned earlier that I had this kind of crisis. I call it a crisis of confidence. It was um, after the army and, you know, the, the mental things I was dealing with. It was also insecurities would grow being in an MBA program with such smart people around me. And I took that into the pharma world where I developed a, de um, a debilitating fear of public speaking. I developed a stutter, all these things I never had when I was leading in combat, I started to experience. And I realized it was holding me back from my career and I didn't really understand why. So I started to take steps when I realized I was changing um, and I was losing my confidence to um, build that confidence back up. And so after I've made done everything I want in the pharma industry, which doesn't have many female mentors and senior leaders out there. I never had a strong female mentor in the pharma industry. I have made it my mission to be both a coach and a mentor for individuals in the industry um, that are looking to grow their confidence, that are that are essentially experiencing what I experienced, which is so common for women, not just in pharma, but women yeah. who um, you know, are coming into their own, they, they carry a lot of, we, as women are told so many things. So I call myself an empowerment ambassador. It is all about empowering people specifically women is where I'm starting, but I actually, you know, I have men coming to me that want to work with me. So I, and I, and outside of the, um, pharma industry, but this is where I'm, this is where I'm focused. Um, so helping women and, and others, uh, build up their confidence means that you also have to shed what no longer serves you. So I have yeah. an empowerment program. It's a three-part process and I do coaching plus mentor mentorship because I've walked the walk. I'm not just an executive coach who's, you know, I'm like, I've walked the walk. So, yeah. um, that's my, that's, that's my passion and, um, what I'm doing totally all in, uh, starting this year. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so good. I'm sure you'd be, more than amazing for all these mentees that you're taking on. Um, so just to kind of wrap this up, do you have like maybe a positive message for our viewers and listeners and um, like a little takeaway perhaps? I would say my number one thing uh, for me in my life has been adversity, right? Overcoming overcoming challenges from West Point to the army and, and in combat to, you know, failed 10 year relationship and um, breast cancer and even rising the ranks in the biotech and even writing a book, right? And dating. I, I feel like there's a theme for me personally, and I think we each have our own themes and things that we can work on. For me, it's been overcoming adversity. And I can confidently say that when I have recognized the opportunity in that ad adversity, it has opened me up. Having breast cancer was incredibly hard, especially not having somebody in my life. Um, but if it weren't for breast cancer, I wouldn't be where I'm at. I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't be in the mind space on that. I, I was never medicated for clinical depression. Right. So, and that's a whole nother discussion of how I got out of it and with therapy and, um, meditation and all this other stuff, but it was hard work, but it transformed me. So my message is there's transform transformation right available for all of us. We just have to recognize the opportunity on our own journeys and take the opportunity to, to step into it and embrace it. And it's, and it's scary and it's hard, but when you come out of it, you really are a butterfly, right? You are, you are limitless and you can fly. I agree. <laughs> Christy, that was amazing. Thank you so much for your time and for all your really positive uh, messages. And uh, I hope we find our uh, bonfire soon. <laughs> So much for having me. It's been such a ple pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed your book. Everybody here should read both of our books, but they really, they really <laughs> so, thank you.
All right. Thanks so much. Bye, Christine. Bye.